Can you explain how that's possible to tie together so many problems in a nice bunch that if one is proven to be efficient, then all are? The first uh, and most important stage of progress was a result by uh, Stephen Cook, um, who showed that a certain problem called the satisfiability problem of propositional logic uh, is as hard as any problem in the class P. So the propositional logic problem is expressed in terms of um, expressions involving the logical operations and or and not operating 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 on uh, variables that can be either true or false. So uh, an instance of the problem would be some formula involving and or and not. Um, and the question would be whether there is an assignment of truth values to the variables in the problem that would make the formula true. So, for example, if I take um, the formula uh, A or B and A or not B and not A or B and not A or not B and take the conjunction of all four of those so-called expressions, you can determine that no assignment of truth values to the variables A and B um, will allow that conjunction of what are called clauses uh, to be true. So that's an example of a formula in um, propositional logic involving expressions uh, based on the operations and, or, and not. Um, that's an example of a problem which ha which is not satisfiable. There is no solution that satisfies all of those constraints. And that's like one of the cleanest and fundamental problems in computer science. It's right. like a nice statement of a really hard problem. It's a, it's a nice statement of a really hard problem. And, and what Cook showed is that um, every problem in NP is can be re-expressed as an instance of the satisfiability problem. So to do that, he uh, used the observation that a very simple abstract machine called the Turing machine um, can be used to describe any algorithm, uh, 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 an algorithm for any realistic computer can be translated into uh, an equivalent algorithm on uh, one of these uh, Turing machines, which are extremely simple. So a Turing machine, there's a tape, and you can yeah, you, you have walk along that data tape. on a tape, and you have basic instructions, uh, a finite list of instructions, which say which, which say if you're reading a particular symbol on the tape, um, and you're in a particular state, then you can move to. Um, a different state and change the state of the number that you or the element that you were looking at, the cell of the tape that you were looking at. And that was like a metaphor and a mathematical construct that Turing put together to represent all possible computation. All possible computation. Now, one of these so-called Turing machines is too simple to be useful in practice, but for theoretical purposes, we can depend on the fact that an algorithm for any computer can be translated into one that would run on a Turing machine. Right. Uh, and then using that fact, um, he could sort of describe um, any possible non-deterministic polynomial time algorithm, any, pro any algorithm for a problem in NP could be expressed as a sequence of uh, moves of the Turing machine uh, described in terms of reading a symbol on the tape um, while you're in a given state and moving to a new state and leaving behind a new new symbol. And given that uh, the fact that any non-deterministic polynomial time algorithm can be described by a list of such instructions, you could translate the problem into the language of the satisfiability problem. Is that amazing to you, by the way, if you take yourself back when you were first thinking about this space of problems? Is that, how amazing is that? 
it, it's astonishing. When you look at Cook's proof, it's not too difficult to sort of figure out why this is why this is so, but the implications are staggering. It, it tells us that this, of all the problems in NP, all the problems where solutions are easy to check, uh, they can they can all be rewritten in terms of uh, the satisfiability problem. Yeah, it's uh, in a adding so much more weight to the P equals NP question, because all it takes is to show that one That's right. One so, algorithm in this class. So the P versus NP can be re-expressed as, as simply asking whether the satisfiability problem of propositional logic is solvable in polynomial time. But there's more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I encountered Cook's paper when he published it in a conference in 1971. Yeah, so when I saw uh, Cook's paper and saw this uh, reduction of, of, all, of each of the problems in NP by a uniform method to, to the satisfiability problem of propositional logic, that meant that the satisfiability problem was a universal combinatorial problem. And it occurred to me, through experience I had had in trying to solve other combinatorial problems, that there were many other problems which seemed to have that universal structure. And so I began looking for reductions from the satisfiability to other problems. Um, uh, one of the other problems would be uh, the so-called integer programming problem of um, solving a determining whether there's a solution to a um, a set of linear inequalities involving integer variables. So it's like linear programming, but there's a constraint mm -hmm. that the variables must m be remain integers. Integers, in fact, must be either zero or one. It could, take, could only take on those values. And that makes the problem much harder. Yes, that makes the problem much harder. And um, it was not difficult to show that the satisfiability problem can be restated as an integer programming problem. So can you pause on that? Was that one of the first mappings that you tried to do? And how uh, hard is that mapping? You said it wasn't hard to show, but you know, that's a, that's a big in, a leap. <laughs> it is a big leap, yeah. Well, let me, let me give you another example. Um, another problem uh, in NP is whether a, a graph contains a clique of a given size. Um, and now um, the question is, can we reduce the propositional logic problem to the problem of whether there's a clique of a certain size? Well, if you look at the propositional logic problem, it can be expressed as a number of clauses, each of which is a um, of the form A or B or C, where A is either one of the variables in the problem or the negation of one of the variables. And the uh, an instance of the propositional log logic problem can be rewritten using operations of Boolean logic, can be re be written as the conjunction of a set of clauses, or the and of a set of ors, where each clause is a, a disjunction, an or of variables or negated variables. So the the question of uh, the, in the satisfiability problem is whether those clauses can be simultaneously satisfied. Now, to satisfy all those clauses, you have to find one of the terms in each clause, which is going to be given the, which is going to be true in your truth assignment. But you can't make the same variable both true and false. So, if you have a, 
the variable A in one clause, and you want to satisfy that clause by making A true, you can't also make the complement of A true in some other clause. And so the goal is to make every single clause true if it's possible to satisfy this. And the way you make it true is at least one term in the clause must be uh, must true. be true. Got it. So so now we uh, to convert this problem to something called the independent set problem, where you're just sort of asking for uh, a set of vertices in a graph such that no two of them are adjacent, sort of the opposite of the clique problem. Um, so we've seen that we can now express that as um, finding a set of terms, one in each clause, without picking both the variable and the negation of that variable. Because you, if the variable is assigned the truth value, the negated variable has to have the opposite truth value. Right. And so we can construct a graph where the vertices are the terms in all of the clauses, and you have uh, an edge between two um, terms if um, if uh, an edge between two occurrences of terms, uh, either if they're both in the same clause because you're only picking one element from each clause, and also an edge between them if they represent opposite values of the same variable because you can't make a variable both true and false. And so you get a graph where you have all of these occurrences of variables. You have edges, which, which mean that you're not allowed to choose um, both ends of the edge, either because they're in the same clause or they're con negations of one another. Right, and that's a, first of all, sort of to zoom out, that's a really powerful idea that you can take a graph and connect it to a logic equation right. somehow and do, do that mapping for all possible formulations of a particular problem on a graph. Yeah. I mean, that, that still is hard for me to believe that, yeah. <laughs> that that's possible. That that there, like, what do you make of that? That um, there's such a union of there's such a friendship among all these problems across that somehow are akin to combinatorial uh, algorithms that they're all somehow related. Yeah, I, I I know it can be proven. Yeah, but what do you make of it that that that's true? Well, if they just have the same expressive power, you can take any one of them and translate it into the terms of the other. You know, but the fact that they have the same expressive power also somehow means that they can be translatable. Right. And what I did in the 1971 paper was to take uh, 21 fundamental problems, the commonly occurring problems, of packing, covering, matching, and so forth, are lying in the class NP, and show that the satisfiability problem can be re-expressed as any of those. That any of those have the same expressive uh, expressive power. So, yeah, and that was like throwing down the gauntlet of saying <laughs> there's probably many more problems like this. Right. But that's just saying that look, that they're all the same. They're all the same. Uh, but not exactly. They're, you know, they're all the same in terms of whether they are um, rich enough to express any of the others. Um, but that doesn't mean that they have the same computational complexity. But what we can say is that either all of these problems or none of them are solvable in polynomial time. Yeah, so where does NP completeness and NP hard Classes oh, oh, that's just a small technicality. So when we're talking about decision problems, that means that the answer is just yes or no. The, the, there, there is a clique of size 15 or there's not a clique of size 15. 
On the other hand, an optimization problem would be asking, um, find the largest clique. The answer would not be yes or no, it would be 15. So, um, so when you're asking for the, when you're putting a valuation on the different solutions, and you're asking for the one with the highest valuation, that's an optimization problem. And there's a very close affinity between the two kinds of problems. But uh, the counterpart of being the hardest decision problem, the hardest yes-no problem, the counterpart of that uh, is, is to minimize or maximize an objective function. And so a problem that's hardest in the class when viewed in terms of optimization, those are called NP-hard rather than NP-complete. And NP-complete is for decision problems. And NP-complete is for decision problems.